Uh, Dr. Ruth is my sexual fantasy. If I hear one more story about good sex out of this very, very adorable but elderly lady who doesn't know what sex is today because she can't have had sex since yesteryear. Dr. Ruth. Ah, everyone knows her. Everyone sees her on the tube, hears her on the radio, lectures. It's premature veneration, I think. Hi, I'm Jerry Delafamina. And I'm Judy Licht, and welcome to the Judy and Jerry Show. You know, it's impossible to talk about Dr. Ruth and not think about sex, but that is exactly what we're going to do tonight. We're going to talk to Dr. Ruth and never, ever mention sex. Now, Jerry and I have been friends of hers for years, and she is one of the most extraordinary women we have ever met. She's an author, serious scholar, and a soldier who was actually wounded in combat with an absolutely incredible life story. And Jerry and I have been privileged, as I said, to know the other side of Dr. Ruth. And tonight, we want to share that with you. Ruth, everybody thinks that they know you. I mean, everyone knows Dr. Ruth. But I don't think they do. Who's the real Dr. Ruth? Now, look at your face, Jerry. By just the way you're asking that question, um, you are quite right. Because I do talk a lot about sex. Everybody knows that. Um, I don't think that they think not to know who is the real Dr. Ruth, but they really don't know the story. And um, it made sense, Jerry and uh, Judy, because you really can't mix the two. If you want to really talk about what has happened to me in my lifetime, then, like Judy said before, we're going to put the sex and the talk about sex and my being at conscious fantasy, which I like to hear. I'm going to put that aside. What is your earliest memory? You know, it's interesting that you have asked me to talk about my life today here. Because I just came back from Frankfurt. And I went to Frankfurt because they had a three-day uh, course at the university about Frankfurt Jews. And I was the keynote speaker about those early experiences. Um, when I had to leave Frankfurt. My very early experience is really from Frankfurt. That's where I lived with a mother, a father, a grandmother that I adored. And um, now that I'm a grandmother, that's why I'm smiling about that. Um, the grandparents in the village that I loved very much. I was a very uh, well brought up uh, only child of uh, middle-class Jewish Orthodox parents and very much loved. Um, and I, when I think about that, of course, it makes me very sad because at the age of 10, my mother and grandmother, my father already was taken to a um, labor camp, decided that I ought to participate, that I ought to join uh, what is called a kinder transport a group of children who left Germany in 39, just before the war, thinking that we would be reuni reunited with our uh, parents, and that's not what happened. You were sent to Switzerland. Yeah. I was um, sent. I didn't want to go. Um, I said, I don't want to leave my family, this nice, um, warm childhood. Uh, but they told me that I must go. And if I think, it makes me very sad, because that was really a supreme sacrifice that my parents did by sending their only child to safety. If they had not sent me on that train with another 300 German Jewish children to safety, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to the two of you. I would be dead, because they all perished. Ruth, I remember you telling the story of the last time you saw your father. And it was very sad, and, and I remember the description you gave. Could you tell us what happened on Crystal Knot? It's interesting because I, uh, it's, it's just the timing is superb for me to talk about that right here in this great country of the United States, um, just now coming back from Germany. 
uh, right after that night uh, when the synagogues were burned, that's called Kristallnacht, a few days later, my father was picked up early in the morning uh, by Nazis. Um, there was no brutality, but I do remember, and that was the last I've ever uh, seen my father, that he entered um, a car, turned around and tried to muster a smile. And now that you, Jerry, are a father, um, again, uh, you can imagine what that would mean to say goodbye and not to know if you're going to see that child of yours ever again. And um, I can only say to them that all I do um, uh, is to really uh, remember that they made that sacrifice by sending me. You were sent to this orphanage in Switzerland with a hundred other Jewish children. What was it like there? What did they trained you to be a maid, didn't they? I mean, what was yeah. You see, what I once told Jerry, Judy, you don't know about that, is when I'm not going to do television anymore, when I'm not going to be Dr. Ruth anymore, I have a diploma of a Swiss housemaid. I can come to Jerry and I can say, Jerry, here is my diploma. I'm coming to work for you. What uh, happened to us was actually sad because here we had children like myself coming from a, a superb background in terms of intellectual learning, uh, being in an orphanage where they had one teacher for 40 children. They didn't let, I was 10 years old, they didn't let me go to high school because they would have had to pay for it. And uh, so they made us, not just myself, uh, learn a menial occupation thinking, because in Switzerland it's not like in the United States, where after five years you are assured that you can stay in Switzerland. You knew that you have to move on. So they forced you to be study to be a But I have an official diploma of a housemaid. Well, and it came in handy, and we're going to find out why right after this. Stay with us. The story gets even more interesting. <laughs> Dr. Ruth Trailblazer. She's, uh, she's one of a kind, and I really appreciate people like that. She broke the mold. Dr. Ruth, I think, has made a great contribution in the world of freeing up the human spirit. We're back with this incredible story of Carola Ruth Siegel, who you now know as Dr. Ruth Westheimer. Uh, we told about the uh, Kristallnacht, the story to the Swiss orphanage. Ruth, after the war was over, did you ever try to find your parents? Yes, they came, uh, lists came out of the concentration camps. And all of us children, night after night, were poring over those lists to see if somebody of uh, the family would uh, appear. I was at that time 15 and a half, 16, and I, I still had hopes that maybe somebody would come back. Um, but then after a very uh, short period of time, uh, one already knew that the Red Cross had sent out all of the lists that were available, and uh, then I realized I was an orphan. Uh, not only my parents, but also the grandparents, the uncles and aunts, there was just nobody left. It was a sad, sad beginning of my life. Ruth, you slept in a, in a tent on the beaches of Marseille. Uh, you were got to Israel, you happen to be the only sex therapist in the world who can assemble a submachine gun blindfolded. I mean, there might be another one, but I'm you, pretty sure it's I you. don't think so. Not, not right now. Not right now, but maybe maybe there are some others. Oh, and that goes away. It's like riding a bicycle. <laughs> I, right. But i tell you something. Um, that, uh, Jerry and Judy, was not an act of heroism on my part. In 45, I went with a group of uh, children and young adults because by that time I believed very much in Zionism and I realized that Jews need a homeland of their own. I went to then Palestine. In 47, all of us were trained uh, to be soldiers because we realized that things would not be so good. I know if you ask any question that I don't like, I know how to throw a hand grenade. And I was a sniper. I know how to put a stand gun, a British stand gun, 
together with my eyes closed, but I couldn't do it today anymore. I was fortunate in that I had never had to kill anybody. But I was trained as a sniper. Uh, but I was very badly wounded in 48 <coughs> on both my legs. But that's not why I'm short. <laughs> I would have been short in any case. And I, I was very fortunate because I can ski, I can dance a whole night. Um, it was a difficult time in then Palestine that then became Israel. From Crystal Knox to a Swiss mm -hmm. orphanage to the Israeli underground. Yeah. It's the stuff that movies are made of. There's no television movie I've seen recently that's any better than that. Yeah, I, Ruth, you came to this country. You, first you married in Israel, went to France. First I married the first guy who offered to marry me because I was very much alone. And I once did a study, that's the study that I talked about in Switzerland, about all of us. And it's interesting, all of us married early, all of us went back to the values of the middle class that we grew up in. I, so I married the first guy, we are still good friends. I then went with him to Paris. And I was very fortunate. I was a director of a kindergarten. By now, I was a kindergarten teacher. And I was able to go to the Sorbonne, to the University of Paris, to study psychology. And then I came to this country on a visit, just to visit an uncle in San Francisco, because I had no family left. So I thought, I want to check out if this uncle is really as short as I am. <laughs> <laughs> and look what has happened. I got to New York. I realized that I could pick up a master's. The new school for social research was the university in exile that accepted professors from Europe, political refugees and Jews, and they gave me a scholarship. Now there is a Ruth Westheimer fellowship at that school. But one of the things I think is interesting, we talked about your getting a maid certificate before, is that you, in order to support yourself, when you came over here, you worked as a housemaid. One dollar. A dollar an hour. A dollar an hour. No, first job. it was 75 cents. <laughs> <laughs> and this is, I mean, it's an incredible story. I tell you that um, this country, and this is very serious, this country has been very generous to very many immigrants and refugees. We today sometimes forget about this because we always think about the problems in this country. Okay, I've got to ask you this. The rest is history. You went on, you worked, uh, you know, and you got your doctorate. You work for Planned Parenthood, you then went and got, became a professor uh, in sexual therapy and, and had patients and so on. But I've got to ask you, you mentioned the fact that you were in Germany recently, Ruth, and I know that you're in discussions with the, with the German television people right now to do a series there. You go back to speak there and give lectures. How is it for you to go back to Germany, know that you might do a television series there with the same people who destroyed your family? How can you? I tell you what, you have to realize something very seriously. I never took any money from Germany in terms of reparation because you cannot pay for what has happened. But you must realize that there is a new generation. I'm now 65. I have no problems with people who are my age or younger. That's a new world. At the same time, it's a good question because I told them I will only do a television. I speak German fluently. I just did some television there. I will only do it if they pay me a lot of money, almost as much as Jerry de la Femina gets. <laughs> For what? <laughs> <laughs> so I said, because it's an important question, I don't like to be there. I can't, or whenever I'm there, I go every year to the Frankfurt Book Fair, because that's where the books are being sold. That's where I come back with a new um, a contract and new ideas. I'm very happy when that plane lands back in New York. However, I also have to realize that I have an obligation because I tell you something very seriously. The people with numbers from Auschwitz and concentration camps, very soon none of them are going to be around. Even people like myself who can still be the one saying it did happen so that this revisionist can't say it never happened. They are going to get older and won't be around. I have an obligation to talk about it. The movie Schindler's List, it shows how people who look and act like ordinary people can turn into monsters and can be monsters. I, I, I hear Mr. Farrakhan saying things about people that don't sound any different than what I heard in the 1930s. And you know, 
the danger here is that uh, they don't only, those people who hate, don't only talk about Jews, they also talk about homosexuals, they also talk about um, other people, they talk about people, maybe one of these days they are going to talk about bald-headed people. They do so, already. We do already. She does. She does all the time. About bald-headed people, they may be right, though. <laughs> but <laughs> but they, you see... They can't they can do it here. That's, they can be here. Yes, and that's why all of us have that obligation to stand up and be counted. Let me tell you something about Schindler's List. I'm very grateful to Steve Spielberg because that wasn't easy for him to do. And I really, I told him that, that I'm very happy. The most important sentence in that film is that this Schindler, for whatever reason, we don't have time to discuss his psychological profile, he saved on his list were 1,100 people. And guess what? Today, out of those 1,100, there are 6,000. When I look at my grandson, I say, Hitler did not want me to have a grandson. So this is the proof that Hitler was wrong, that they will not succeed. Because if you think of those people who are now that next generation, that's the triumph of what has happened. We'll be back with more of Dr. Ruth right after this. Dr. Ruth, I met once at a, at a uh, Israeli Bonds dinner, and uh, the wonderful publicist for the Heidi Chronicles was with me, Mark Thibodeau, who I loved and I always referred to as my fiancé. So when I spoke to accept some award, I said I'd like to thank my fiancé, Mark Thibodeau. Dr. Ruth kissed my mother and said, she's getting married. I'm so happy. <laughs> so, so but Dr. Ruth thinks I'm Wendy Wallace's thing, Thibodeau. That is so much like her. I think Dr. Ruth is the eternal mother. <laughs> well, I have a great story. You remember, when we got married, Dr. Ruth was there, and my mom was there. My mom is four foot nine, at most four foot ten. Don't exaggerate. She towers over Dr. Ruth. <laughs> In fact, my mother once referred to Dr. Ruth as that nice, short woman. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, I've got to ask you this, Ruth. People do tease you. They make jokes about height. And, and I, I remember reading in, in your autobiography that the kids used to call, your nickname was the comma, the uh, comma. First it was the point on the eye, ah. just the dot. Right. And then when I was about eight or nine years old, they called me the comma. You're, you're absolutely right. Did, did, but, you know, they, 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 did you ever, they put you in a trash can or something? <laughs> you know, kids are mean, but as an adult, you make the best jokes yourself about that, but does it ever really hurt you? Um, no, not anymore. But when I was a teenager, I thought nobody's going to marry me. In the meantime, I realized that plenty of uh, men did marry me. <laughs> now I'm married. Three, of them. Three. <laughs> Fred, Fred, now I'm married. married 32 years with the same men. Um, it wasn't easy to be so short, um, but now I actually like it because I make the best of it. And you know, when you make the best out of a situation, uh, that's also in the Talmud. There is a saying that says, a lesson taught with humor is a lesson retained. So when I now can say to the two of you, size does not matter, that's the type of humor that helps me to teach about the other subject matter. I knew we weren't going to talk about sex, but... You heard her. Size she does ma not matter. No. We didn't make this. On, we're on the record. Uh, I, I listened to you, and I know I've had the same problem because I look at things a little differently, and I may laugh and smile, and I have a good sense of humor. And do you find that people don't take you as, as seriously because you, ha you, you laugh at yourself? I mean, my problem is I think that people really believe that if you're sour and if you're serious, uh, you're in control. They, they, they believe that people who are having a good time are not in control. Do you have that problem with people I, not? I, I don't really, you know, there are some people who think that I only talk about sex. Are quite correct. But I think if they listen to me a little bit, they know. Like uh, Wendy was saying, I believe in family. I believe in raising children. I believe in uh, um, honoring your parents and grandparents. You know, that whole um, story. So 
if I can give you some advice, Jerry, do not lose your sense of humor. Because we have enough sourpusses out there. What we really need is that combination of um, intelligence and creativity and to say and humor. And he also lives with me, so he's got to have a sense of humor. I mean, that's not the... <laughs> but, but, you know, you, I, I have a theory that what has made you prevail, really prevail, uh, and succeed and get to the top, um, among, you know, in the most horrible circumstances, is your sense of humor. There are a lot of smart people around. There are a lot of ambitious people around. See, I'm not a comedian. I couldn't tell you a joke, even if you would ask me. But I can see the humor in a situation and use it. And I think it also helped me survive. After all, having been an orphan at the age of 10, I think in my diaries, um, it comes out quite clearly uh, that I can say you have to have that spirit of survival. That has to do something with the using humor. You kept the diary, and you're uh, about the same age, maybe a little bit younger than Anne Frank. I guess girls at that stage kept diaries. Mm -hmm. at that, in those days. Do you still have the diaries? Of course. You do. I, and I don't let anybody read them, not even my good friends Jerry or Judy. Uh, and it's in German. But I use them for my autobiography. I use those diaries for uh, giving a lecture, for example, right now when I give a lecture at the, at the University of uh, Frankfurt. Uh, I think the diaries were very important. And you mentioned just now Anne Frank. You know, we looked alike. Because children in 39 looked like she was my age. And here I walk and I say, you know, look at me. I'm fortunate. I'm alive. I have a family. I uh, have a grandson. And look what happened to her. So the, the diary actually helped me have a friend throughout those years to confide uh, in. Well, we hope you have many, many years of writing into diaries. Okay. Thank you so and much. And then I'll come and talk to you again. Thank see you. See you soon. Thank you. Thanks for being with us today, Dr. Lee. Thank you. We'll see you next week. Hope you had a good time.